everybody. Our last podcast of the day. Very, very excited for this one. Uh, I believe we have an amazing guest who's also signed some books. So if you like what she has to say today, please make sure you stop by and pick up a uh, signed copy of the book. Um, but with that, we're going to go ahead and get started with Morning Stars, The Big Picture. Turn it over to our hosts. Thank you. Thank you. Tanya Hester, author of two award-winning books, Work Optional, Retire Early, The Non-Penny Pinching Way, and Wallet Activism, How to Use Every Dollar You Spend, Earn, and Save as a Force for Change, is best known for retiring from her career at the age of 38 after watching her dad get forced into early retirement by his disability, which she has inherited. Though her book, uh, Work Optional, is geared toward nearly everyone, it was inspired by her desire to help others with disabilities retire on their own terms rather than be subjected to our insufficient disability safety net system. Tanya, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Before we kick it off, uh, we want to encourage you to submit questions via the app, which we'll get to with about 10 minutes left in the session. So Tanya, for those of you, or for those in the audience that don't know about you, yeah. uh, tell us about your journey and how you arrived here. I always describe my financial journey as extremely boring uh, because I, I very much am a believer in long-term indexing, you know, buy and hold and just let time pass and it really does do the magic for you. Uh, so that's sort of the, the very short version of my early retirement story, which folks are often very interested in because that's a, a topic that, you know, gets a lot of, a lot of ink these days in the press. Um, but in terms of my journey to the book I know we're talking about today, Wallet Activism, um, I really have thought of myself as a, a lifelong activist on different levels. That was the career that I worked at before was political consulting, so working for candidates and causes that I really cared about. I also was a journalist before that, and now I'm sort of a very, very part-time journalist again, which is great. I can write about things that I think are important. And I, I realized as I was writing about all these different personal finance topics that align primarily to retirement, that there wasn't a lot of guidance out there for people who consider themselves values-based, you know, who want to make decisions aligned to the things that they care about, which we now know is a huge percentage of us. It's almost 90% of people want their financial choices to align to their values. And so I just had that great opportunity of being a retired person with a lot of free time and interest. And that really let me take on some of the hard questions that I think a lot of folks otherwise struggle to answer. And so that, that's just a little about me. Like I, I love answering the impossible questions. I, I find that really fun. We'll do our best. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are going to spend most of our time talking about the new book, mm -hmm. but of course you're best known as a fire advocate. Um, how, how has, uh, the uh, coronavirus uh, and its after effects changed the movement. It was funny early in, well, nothing is funny about the pandemic, um, but early in the pandemic, there was a lot of speculation that that was gonna be the end of FIRE, which for those who aren't familiar, that's financial independence, retire early. It's a lot of folks who are looking to retire in their late 30s, 40s, sometimes, I mean, sometimes in their 20s. But there was a lot of belief that we were going to get the pandemic, we we're going to get a big market crash, and that was going to pour water all over the fire movement. And I think we've seen just the opposite. We see a lot of press now about quiet quitting, you know, people who are attempting to do as little as possible as they can at work. Uh, you have the opposite. You have the great resignation that we're still in, according to the data, but perhaps it's slowing a little bit. But I think that the pandemic really showed people that relying on your job for everything in your life is not a great idea. And that if you can try to build some financial security in for yourself, that is a really, really good thing. And so I, I think we're only going to see that accelerate, whether it looks exactly like fire or not, or whether it's just folks trying to have more financial security or have it at an earlier age or have more flexibility in their life or more work-life balance. I think we're going to see all of that accelerate unless we have a real kind of readjustment of the way that we work and pay people for work in our society. What are some things that um, people are getting right as they attempt financial independence and retiring early? We heard a, a snippet earlier about that something that some people are getting it wrong and probably they didn't read your book and follow your suggestions, but <laughs> what are some things that people are doing right that you've, that you've seen? Yeah, work? you know, for those who saw Morgan Housel speak earlier, he talked about uh, 
that most people are going through life and managing their money with a lot of greed and fear, which I think tend to go together. And then he said that folks doing it wrong are the fire movement. And I thought, hey, 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 you know, <laughs> it's definitely true that some are, uh, because I, I think that there are a lot of folks who view early retirement as just, they sort of use it to run away from their frustrations. And often they'll project a lot of troubles in their life onto their work and use it to run away from that when I think if you plan correctly and you deal with your personal challenges that we all have and you think about what you actually want your life to look like, I think that you can avoid a lot of that boredom maybe that comes later or directionlessness. But I think the biggest thing that the FIRE movement does that is the part that I really love more than any other part uh, is the focus on enough of understanding what is enough and stopping when you hit that point of not feeling the need to endlessly accumulate. And I think that you can look at that as just a very practical financial thing that it's, it's a wonderful gift to say, okay, this is my point and now I can go do what I want to do and money can be optional um, in my life. Or you can actually view that as kind of a, a social justice or economic justice move because by more people leaving the workforce at an earlier age, it's actually freeing up more spots and more opportunities for others coming up behind. You know, it's much better to have people leaving at 40, 45, 50 than everybody hanging on to their title until they're 75 and no one can move up. So there are a few different ways to look at it, but I think really focusing on enough is, is a good thing on a lot of levels. And that's one thing I think advisors are really good at mm -hmm. and that individuals are terrible at. As I think Morgan said this morning, if you've mm -hmm. got two million, you want five. <laughs> if you've got five, you want eight. And I recently worked with an advisor and kind of, uh, they put my mind at rest, put it that good. way. Yeah. Um, by the way, you were on our other podcast, uh, The Long View, in April 2020, and kind of predicted the great resignation. I think you would have gotten credit for that if you had given it its name. <laughs> right. so I'll keep that in mind for next acronym. time. Yeah. Yeah. Give it a name with capital letters. Um, so, one more question about fire. Um, a few years ago, you were quoted in the New York Times about the dominance of men mm -hmm. in the fire movement. Has that changed at all since? That time. You know, I continue to believe that that was always a misconception. What it was is that men, especially white men in tech, uh, which those in tech know that white men aren't even necessarily representative of tech, but that was who was getting the press. So if you looked at the stories on financial media or sometimes things like the Today Show, it was a lot of white men and many of them, if not most of them, were married, but then their partner was not viewed as getting any credit for it. These were mostly hetero couples. And I just, I, it, my frustration was more with the absence of the voices, not with the absence of the actual women. And so I think we continue to see a lot of gender diversity and, you know, really folks from all walks of life, including many more income levels than you would expect, uh, continue to be in the movement. But I think it's been a really good trend that we see more diversity in who is speaking for that movement now. Uh, so I'd love to see that trend continue. It's still not quite as diverse as the folks who actually are doing this of aiming to be work optional, but it's, it's good progress. So moving to wallet activism, you were asked a couple times at the book signing, what does it mean? Uh, and you joke that you answer it a little bit differently every <laughs> time. What's your answer right now? What is, what is wallet activism? Yes, yeah, so wallet activism, if, if we were talking in a purely progressive sort of audience, I would say it's using the tools of capitalism to dismantle capitalism. But that's not who we're talking about, so I wouldn't say that, uh, so forget I did. Um, Wallet activism is recognizing and using your financial power in all its forms to create change that aligns to your values and doing it in ways that are impactful. And so my worldview is progressive. The book is written from that place, but someone came up and asked me, could I use this if I care about the dark side? And I said, yes, you could. <laughs> um, I hope you won't. But uh, whatever your beliefs are, it's really just a tool to think through what your values are that you'd wish to express through your financial choices and then gives you a whole menu of options for how you can do that. And I, I think most people have bought the narrative that's out there that your individual choices don't matter. And maybe for advisors who advise super wealthy folks who have massive investment portfolios, probably those folks don't think that as much. But I think for everybody, you know, seeing that you actually have power in many more ways than you think is, is a really valuable thing and really empowering thing. What are some ways that advisors can engage with clients to uncover what they care about and, and um, what things are meaningful to them so that they can 
um, advise them along the, the lines of those interests? Yeah, you know, the first thing is I think just kind of changing your mindset to understand that um, money is political, you know, and, and we've tended in personal finance, I'm more on the media side, but I, I hear this from advisors too, that there's been this belief of like, well, we don't go there, you know, we, we yep. focus on this part, we just talk about the dollars and cents and look at the spreadsheets and we don't talk about the world outside, but that's not the reality of people's lives, including every single one of your clients and probably your own lives for advisors. And so I think, Getting rid of that fear of touching it is really good. And hopefully everyone's heard here at Future Proof a few times on different panels of what a high percent of investors care about aligning their financial choices to their values. It's almost 90%, and we should expect that number to grow to pretty close to 100% in the coming years. And so it's, it's first just getting rid of that fear of starting the conversation. And then I think it can be as simple as saying, are there particular issues that you really care about that you want to make sure are included in your plan or are excluded from your plan? Are there other approaches that you care a lot about? And then I think you can go from there. So if a client says, yes, I'm really concerned about the climate crisis, what can we do? Then you've got a menu of options there, but you can also do things like look beyond investments and say, okay, well, let's look at where your cash lives. You know, are you banking at a big bank that is one of the largest funders in the world of new fossil fuel projects? You know, we could switch you over to a different institution and then that's a, you know, it's a, it's a pain to change your bank, but you do it one time, then it's done. Um, or is it looking at where your money market accounts are and your fixed income accounts are? I think people think it's only about equities and stock and it's really a much broader array of options that you've got to share. In the book, you talk about living a zero waste lifestyle. Um, I don't know if anyone here tries that, but what is that like? Um, well, to be clear, I don't live a zero waste lifestyle uh, because I tried it in, in earnest. And that's kind of the story I used to start the book that it, it's to me an emblem of how inaccessible a lot of the solutions are that we propose or we put all this burden on individuals and we say, okay, you have to be totally vegan and never eat a piece of bacon. You have to never get in a car. You have to shop zero waste and otherwise you're causing climate change and you should feel terrible about yourself. And I don't think that's one. We're not going to convince people that way. You know, we have to give people messages that are more accessible and feel doable for them. But we also, I think just have to look at this in a more moderate way of what's actually sustainable. If we view our social change and environmental change activities as a diet, everyone knows how well diets work long term. Um, you can't stay on them. So it's, it's not sustainable. Not sustainable. <laughs> exactly. So we're looking for instead, you know, how can we reshape our lives in little ways bit by bit and look for more and not worry about perfection so that we instead build something we can sustain over the long term and that we can talk with other folks about and not be on such a high pedestal because we're doing this crazy hard thing like zero waste uh, that they feel is, is not doable. And I, so I think we're much more likely to spread the word and inspire people looking at more realistic solutions. Okay. So speaking of um, zero waste, low waste, and sustainability, um, what, what place does ESG have in some of your perspectives and, and what you share with investors and, and what they might need to know uh, about working with with clients yeah I think I am I am a, a skeptic of ESG for a number of reasons I think the the lack of a consistent definition I know we might technically get there although I think there's so much pressure on the SEC on the ESG rules that I don't know that we're going to get a particularly strong rule but I think the main misconception among folks about ESG is people believe that it is e and s and G when in fact it is E or S or G. And I use the example in wallet activism of the Spanish petroleum company Repsol that is on almost every European ESG um, index or fund list because they're incredibly transparent. So they, they get a good score on the G, on the governance, and they have a really diverse board and they do some good community stuff. So they get a good social score, but obviously they're a petroleum company. They're pumping fossil fuels out of the ground, which are the, the biggest source of, of carbon emissions and the biggest driver of climate change. So that's something that I think a lot of folks, when they find that out, they go, oh, well, then this is all just greenwashing. Even though there are, are some likely very good products in the space, I think it's important to give folks a different set of tools or, you know, I think we, we always need to be striving for better transparency so that you can see 
really what's in a fund and not just have to take someone's word for it that ESG means it's, it's good. I, I'm really a big fan of the Economist um, proposal to link that score almost mm -hmm. totally to carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and perhaps we call it something else. It doesn't have to be ESG. And, and I think that we've had good discussions at this conference about different ways that we can go kind of more specific on things. So folks who are focused on social justice goals get a different set of metrics. Folks who are focused on climate goals have a set of, of numbers there. Uh, but something that, that lets people know, OK, this is not a big pollution and climate change driver uh, would be a really helpful thing. And right now, that doesn't exist. Yeah. I think one of your books, you, you talk about the, um, the efforts to um, get rid of uh, public smoking. Mm. Um, I, is it in your book? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you know, it feels like having lived through that, that was like a big issue, and there weren't any other issues that I saw competing with it. Mm -hmm. Do you feel at all that now we worry about everything, mm. and because we worry about everything, it prevents us from solving one thing? That's a great question. I, I talk about smoking in the context of helping people understand externalities because that's a big problem with our consumer culture is that I believe everything we buy, and I, I would include a lot of the financial services <laughs> products in that, like, almost everything we buy is priced too cheaply in the sense that it doesn't really reflect the environmental cost, the climate cost. It doesn't reflect the cost of exploited labor that goes into making almost every manufactured product that we buy. And so thinking about the externalities and all that goes in it, I think is really useful for helping people right size their consumption, which then also ties into right sizing the amount they need to save and invest to be able to retire. You know, it, it's all linked together in the same chain. And so I think with smoking, people understand secondhand smoke very quickly. It's like the pack of smoke, the, the price of a pack that a smoker pays is not reflective of the impact to everyone who breathes that secondhand smoke. It's, it's not even reflective of the price to that smoker directly. Mm -hmm. It doesn't pay for their health care. It, do, you know, it doesn't pay for all those things. So I think that's a useful example for thinking about how our stuff now is priced. Our stuff now is priced like packs of cigarettes 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and we need it to be priced maybe a little closer to packs today, which I know in a time of high inflation is not a popular thing to say. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but that could be one upside of this inflation is that it's caused a lot of folks to right size some of their consumption. And if perhaps we keep those prices where they are, it might allow us to backfill with better environmental practices, better labor practices, better pay for a lot of low paid workers. So there could be some opportunities there. But yeah, I, I think you're right to think people are overwhelmed. There are so many things to worry about. And that's really why I try to help people focus on a couple of things, because we can't do everything we'd like to do. We can't focus on every issue. We can't make every perfect choice. I, I don't do everything that's in the book. I just It's not possible. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's really helpful to give folks permission and the tools to prioritize. Great. Yeah, and that, that is possibly a big reason why advisors and, and others don't want to go there because it can quickly become extremely complex. You mentioned the lack of standard definitions um, and more challenging to solve for. So mm -hmm. what, what would you say to advisors who are working with clients who may want to like try to save the world and, and the advisors trying to also help them balance financial goals um, that are very specific? Okay, so here is the thing that I will say that might be most controversial of all. Although I did oh, just good. say high inflation <laughs> could be good. So I don't know if I can top that. But I think the biggest thing that I, I would say is advisors should not assume that every client, especially younger ones, wants to make the highest returns they can. Because we're seeing a growing movement, especially it around. Takes a lot of pressure off, OK? <laughs> <Yeah>. right, so. <laughs> but I, I think a lot of clients, particularly millennials and Gen Z, um, and some young Gen X like me don't actually care about getting the very best return and don't even aren't even concerned about trying to match the s and p you know it's it's often I'm willing to lose a couple of those points if it means that I can do something truly impactful and you know I think we we get a bit uh, i don't know lazy perhaps with the term impact investing and don't always look at what that impact is. And often that impact is I feel better and I sleep better at night when we could actually be looking at the impact on communities that have historically been affected the most by things like um, environmental racism, um, bad climate policy, bad social policy, 
worker exploitation, all those things. Um, but I think it's worth asking that question. If someone comes in and says, you know, I'm really concerned about climate change, I'm really concerned about social injustice, and I don't want to support that, I think the next question naturally needs to be, great, what are your expectations for returns? And maybe you have part of the portfolio that's zero return, that's focused on community reinvestment and, and some of the models that are out there. And then you have the portion that is focused on returns. Uh, there, are, there are great options emerging too that are actually pretty uh, typically invested. They're invested in, in the fossil fuel companies and big tech and a lot of folks who maybe bristle at if you care about things like climate change or social justice, but then they're the firms who have started those funds are committed to playing an active role in the voting process. Mm. And like engine number one, who led the effort to get Exxon to put, you know, get three climate focused directors on their board, they have an ETF called Vote, uh, where it holds all those companies who a lot of progressives would tell you you should boycott or not own, but then they go in and they take an extremely active role. And I'm not, I'm not uh, endorsing that. I don't do due, due diligence. Obviously, that, <laughs> that's the advisor's job. Uh, but there are lots of great examples like that where you could hold those things, but do it in a way where you know that you holding them is being used to push for better things. So there are so many different ways you can go about it. But yeah, I think the biggest thing of just not assuming that every client wants 10% a year, um, year over year, because lots of us, I would include myself in that, are, are okay with much lower returns if it means that we can do something good with our money. Yeah. Full disco disclosure, Morningstar is like the sub-advisor for that vote ETF. Great. So. Well, she brought it up, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if we'd be infected by that. Um, I lost my train of thought. You, you did say something, Tanya, about um, in your book about uh, Whole Foods and the, the uh, expression whole paycheck because mm -hmm. of how much more expensive it is to, to buy food there, but that people are willing to make those kinds of trade-offs, um, it, it stands to reason that with the amount of information and the, the different attributes that an investor might want to consider, that activist investors could perhaps benefit even more from working with an advisor than those who are okay with, you know, an index that tracks, you know, part of the market that they want to get exposure to. Would you advocate for working with an advisor to help with all the information that's out there or how do you? Yeah, and I think it has to start with a little bit of rebranding around the term activist investor mm. because for so long that has meant more like really a, a hostile takeover. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yep. By someone trying to squeeze a bunch <laughs> of value out, but I'm, I'm trying to push to think of it differently, to think of it more like what engine number one did with Exxon and what also happened at Chevron. You know, there there have been some great examples and other folks are working to do similar things with the big banks, you know, the deposit banks. And so, yes, absolutely. I think for folks who, like if I decided, okay, I want to have X number of shares in, you know, British Petroleum, I wouldn't know how to go do all of that. And I yeah. would need to work through an advisor. And I mean, my secret theory that I guess it's not secret because I'm sharing it is that there is a, a lot of money to be made by some advisors who really focus on this, who say, my whole thing is I'm going to be equipping activist investors with the knowledge to make that happen, figuring mm -hmm. out how do you go to a shareholder meeting? How do you put a proposal before the shareholders? How do you go meet with the company um, in advance of it to try to figure out what they might go for? Or how do you meet with the institutional investors who are the largest shareholders of every publicly traded company so that maybe you can get them on board to support your initiative? I mean, that's, that's work that a lot of folks want to do. And I think we're going to see an increasing number of resources for folks. But I think for advisors looking to grow their business, I think there's a big opportunity for some folks. Yeah. Are there advisor, are there resources for advisors to, to help them with that process? Yes, I think just in general, there, something that I've heard from a lot of advisors is that, well, I have clients who come in and they say I'm, they're not that into the ESG idea because I'm, I'm sure you all know that there, 
there's criticism of ESG really from both sides. You've got this kind of anti-woke um, critique coming from the right wing of we should be we should only be looking at fiduciary concerns. Even though I think you could make a very clear argument with California banning gasoline-powered cars in the next decade. You've got the climate bill funding a lot of movement away from gas-powered cars. You could say it is a good fiduciary choice, like very clearly, to get your clients out of oil and gas because of, of the trends that are coming, that we know that's a dying industry, it's just a question of how fast it will die. Um, but I think that you've got that critique and then you've got the critique of folks more from the progressive side saying ESG isn't good enough, it's not a good enough metric. And so I see a lot of advisors say, okay, so I don't know what to do, I feel stuck. And the good news is there are actually a lot of really great resources available now, and there are even more coming. So again, this is not an endorsement because due diligence always required. Uh, but in general, if you have clients who are focused on a social justice focus, the the biggest opportunity right now is to buy into debt funds that specifically uh, try to finance projects in disinvested communities. So they're doing a lot of stuff in African American communities, in uh, other communities of color, and parts of cities that have really become run down and trying to fund some small businesses, fund some initiatives that benefit the community. If you're looking more at the environmental or climate focus, a lot of what's out there are bonds funding clean energy infrastructure. And those can often be hard to identify, but there are folks who are helping to package this stuff. So just some examples are C-Note, who's based in Oakland, California. They specifically do cash and fixed income, and they're, they're working with community development financial institutions, CDFIs, some of you may be familiar with that term. And it's at scale today for retail. So individual investors can go sign up with them, advisors can sign up, they do some institutional. Calvert Impact Capital has something called the Community Investment Note, or the Note. That's another fixed income fund, and that's accessible through most brokerage accounts, which I think is pretty exciting. That's been a hard thing with all the custodianship requirements. We've talked a little bit about Engine Number no. 1 and, and their Vote ETF. They also have another one called NetZ that has a bit higher fees. Vote is really great low fees that honestly is up there with the lowest fee index funds. Uh, but NetZ is, is higher fees, but they specifically look at the folks who are focused on the, the clean energy transition. And then others, Adesina Social Capital has a global social justice ETF, Just Futures Retirement, I'm really excited about. They're gonna be launching a product for 401k and 403b holders next year, because I think that's the next frontier, is how do we get some of this stuff into people's retirement plans? Yeah. And then they've also got um, a retail platform coming later. Um, Seed Commons is a great organization for folks who are looking for hyper-local projects. They have a network of projects all over the country that you can fund through debt. So those are just a few, but I think that folks should keep their eyes and ears open because we're gonna see a lot more of those kinds of things coming. There's a tremendous amount of interest and I think a lot of people in the activist space are starting to understand that they need to speak the language of capitalism a little better. Um, but we're gonna see more of that coming together. So I think that's a, a pretty exciting thing, I think, of just seeing what's coming. You uh, wrote in Bloomberg in June that millennials are fed up with ESG. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, you know, it's, <laughs> I think, the oh, acronym, the yeah. concept, the lack of... I think it's a little bit from all of those. It's, it's, I think people are frustrated that there was this thing, it was supposed to be the answer, and then they realized that every fund can set its own ESG metrics. And by their own metrics, they could be doing great, but they're actually contributing a lot of um, negativity to the world according to that person's values. And so I think there's skepticism of that. I do think that folks are getting more savvy at spotting greenwashing and it's really everywhere you look. And so it's, there's plenty of that in ESG. And I think there's also, we have to acknowledge a conflict of interest in that the people who are packaging ESG funds together and setting the metrics are also really hoping you're gonna invest in their fund and you're gonna make, they're gonna make a whole bunch of money off you. And so they're trying to create something marketable. And when you're doing that, that, that just is inherently a conflict with the values of it. And so I think that is a fundamental flaw of ESG that's essentially unfixable. And so I talk about some of the different ways, you know, we talked earlier about maybe you just have a climate emissions metric and that's the biggest thing or uh, that you're, you're breaking it down a little bit more. I know a lot of folks are working on creating tools that let people 
make better assessments and mm -hmm. see which ESG funds actually live up to their promise. Uh, but I think you do see a lot of younger investors who are looking outside the markets, who are much more interested in local community-based loans to get some more money into communities that have been disinvested. And then you're helping environmental goals and social justice goals at the same time. Um, and I, I think you're going to see more people focused on philanthropy, which I think as advisors, the biggest thing I always say on that is really push your clients to spend their donor advised fund dollars because we know that a lot of folks put money in there, they get the tax break, and then that money just sits and it makes money for the brokerages that hold it, uh, but it doesn't actually do the good it was intended to do. So if you know someone, someone's got a DAF, say how much of that are you gonna spend this year and, and figure out a plan to, put it into to lower it down, yeah. yeah. Um, but. I think the skepticism is, is well-founded. And so I think that folks who are innovating on this and being really, I think transparency is just the, the most important thing. The more you can share about impact, the more you can share about the intent behind it. I think companies who are doing funds who are also themselves nonprofit are going to be in a competitive advantage for a lot of folks, not everyone. Uh, but those are, those are things that I think are just good to keep in mind. Yeah, I think part of the disillusionment among not just the millennials in ESG, but others, is that people probably thought they were buying an impact fund, mm -hmm. and in fact weren't. I don't know that it was intentional that, that fund companies were trying to greenwash anybody, but that's the way it's done on the institutional side a lot. Yeah. Like, but you, you, you create the strategy by subtraction. Yeah, and I think per, to the subtraction point, I, th I think you're going to see a continued interest in direct indexing. That's still pretty new, but I think that a lot of folks like that idea of being able to say, yeah, I mean, I want standard investment, you know, I want a standard portfolio, but I definitely don't want to be invested in tobacco companies or I, you know, th there's just some th issue that I have. Like, I'm, I'm personally really upset about profiting off of uh, assault rifles. So I try to remove guns from my portfolio and things like that. And so I think the, the power that you get through direct indexing and certainly some investors will want to do that themselves. But I also think the direct indexing platforms, as good as they've gotten in a short time, it, they're a little intimidating. So I think you'll see more folks who want to do that through an advisor. Mm -hmm. So taking the, uh, the economist view that we should all focus on the E and not worry about the S and, and G so much, um, how much do you think policy is going to solve those problems versus how investors vote with their dollars? So. I think the policy question is an open one. I think that in the recent Inflation Reduction Act, which I'm sure we all are annoyed that they decided to name it the IRA. Like, come on, that name is taken already. <laughs> RIA, IRA. We IRA. have much to do with inflation either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's primarily a climate investment act, which is great. But I, I think that there's recognition politically that that was their one bite at the apple. I don't think we're going to see major climate legislation again for a while. Um, just politically how divided we are. It's so hard to pass anything. And so I think that we need to keep modest expectations about policy, you know, and on the policy side in that bill, it's mostly incentives, it's very few penalties. So maybe we'll see more regulation at the state level, but even that's a fight depending on who's in the White House of what the EPA is going to let the states regulate. But I think that the, the best strategy to get to some of the change that I personally would like to see, and um, for some folks listening, maybe this is of interest to you too, but you know, very seriously addressing the climate crisis, very seriously addressing social inequity um, and, and those kinds of things. I think that we need to be doing a little of everything or a lot of everything. This idea that it's policy or it's individual choices or this idea that, well, we can, we can boycott a company or we can buy shares in them and then do a shareholder initiative. It's like, no, no, this is, this is an all of the above moment for all of the, the things that we're facing they're they're big deals you know we, we try not to be too doom and gloom about it but but we got to get on it you know <laughs> this is urgent and so it's it's really everything it's it's being mindful of what we buy but I think more than what we buy how much we buy you know just understanding that folks who are wealthy um, in the US or Canada or you know rich countries are really having an outsized impact on both climate and the, the conditions we force on other humans through exploitation to buy the stuff that we love. And so um, looking at kind of a little of everything, of can we buy less generally? Can we stay in our jobs less time to create more opportunity? Can we um, be mindful about where our money lives, both deposits and investments? Can we do a better job with philanthropy? 
can we pay attention to where we live and if that's having a gentrifying impact or for folks who are interested in real estate investing, are we doing that investing in a way that's actually creating good homes for people and not just trying to squeeze money out of communities that are already being squeezed? There are so many different ways we can think about that question. And I think for folks who do have financial means, we, we have more responsibility to do more of these things. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I mean, no one can do everything. So it's looking at what fits in your life. And then as I always try to do, just striving to get a little better over time. Before we go to listener questions, uh, you mentioned philanthropy. We talked, I mentioned Bill Gates in one of our discussions. What's your view on his efforts um, you know, for health, and for environment? Yeah, I mean, I think Bill Gates, through his foundation, has funded, I mean, they've poured an enormous amount of money into particularly Africa and parts of Asia and some of the developing world. Um, but I just generally have a problem with billionaire philanthropy overall, you know, where we're, we've decided to create a tax code in which instead of taxing people properly on their wealth or their high income, we've decided to let them get tax breaks and create these large perpetual foundations that then can set social policy in a, in a huge way. And, and in the U.S. as well, you know, Gates Foundation has put a lot of money into education in the U.S. and has really dictated the way that a lot of schools function. And that was never put to the voters. There's never been any accountability where you can say, well, I don't like what's happening. Who can I vote out of office? And to me, that's, that's just anti-democratic. I'd, I'd much more rather if we taxed high net worth folks appropriately and then had that money to allocate in a public way where we all had some input on that. And if we didn't like what was happening, we could get rid of those guys and get new ones and have that discussion. So that's my general feel. It's less about him and more just about the general practice of big philanthropy and letting folks use these tax sheltered foundations to, to set our social policy without our input. So the, the solution is tax them more and then distribute the money through like governmental uh, channels. Well, I mean, if you look at how our government already functions, the U.S. government is a huge funder of humanitarian programs around the world, of things like a lot of the stuff that Gates funds, are, the U.S. government also funds. So things like vaccines so that we can stop preventable childhood deaths in poorer countries, things like that. Um, if, if the U.S. government just had more funding for that, you know, or, or, or education. Education is chronically underfunded in essentially every state. And that money could be really well spent at the local level where folks know this is what our district needs. Parents could have an input, have input into that, which parents want input into their education. And so knowing that the biggest funder of your kid's classroom is an unaccountable billionaire, I don't think that's a great system. You should have some local control. So that's, that's what I'd argue for is just get it into the tax pipeline. All right, we got some good questions. Um, with healthcare costs rising well above CPI, how can investors, particularly those with chronic or debilitating diseases, prepare for a long uh, or early retirement? Um, I hear you. Uh, I, have, I have that situation. Do what you did. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm a huge fan, uh, pivoting over to early retirement for a moment, um, of treating early retirement and traditional retirement as two separate phases of life and planning and saving for them separately, which is, I think, one of my bigger contributions to the, the conversation around early retirement, so that you're saving, a, a perhaps depending on how early, early retirement is for you, you're saving a fairly substantial um, pot that's in just standard taxable investment accounts and to some extent in cash accounts. And you have to build a more complicated model. This is my big complaint with FIRE is that a lot of the times folks will simplify things to the so-called 4% rule for safe withdrawals and then assume that everything is going to work out. But that model, or really any safe withdrawal rate, assumes that inflation is equal for all categories. And it's not. You know, whether we're talking about healthcare, which is currently going up at about four times the rate of inflation, you've got education, if you have kids coming down the pipeline, we're going to go to college. That's increasing much, much faster than inflation overall. And we could debate whether the, the student loan forgiveness and restructuring is going to have any impact on that, make that worse or better. We don't know yet. Um, people have ideas. But it's building out a, a bit more of a complicated model to make sure that you have enough saved to cover health care. Um, and it does seem that at this point, the Affordable Care Act is going to stick around. It's good to get a sense of the types of tax credits that are available. And I know a lot of folks who sort of reverse engineer their income, which you can do if you're living off investments. You can decide how much to sell so that you fit under certain threshold so that your insurance stays affordable. So there, there are, if for those especially who are 
focused on tax efficiencies with healthcare, there's a lot of room there to wiggle, but that often gets left out of the conversation, which is just too bad. And if you can marry someone from the EU and move over there, that's really your best plan. <laughs> Backup plan. Um, do fire advocates, we'll, we'll get to one of those, do fire advocates need advisors? Do fire advocates need advisors? I think that I, I advise everybody to at least one time go to a, a fee-only planner and get an overall consultation. At least double check your math, look at your assumptions, do what I always tell everyone when I see their plan, which is your inflation assumptions are too low and your social security assumptions are too high. And that's every single one I ever do. I mean, you need someone to look at your plan and tell you that. But I do think that there's value in working with, with folks. I don't think a lot of fire, you know, it has such a DIY spirit. I think a lot of fire folks aren't interested in having all their assets under management and paying high fees to do that. But if someone has offerings that are somewhere in the range of the index funds, I think that would be appealing to a lot of folks. Because I, I think it's a mistake to assume that everyone who you see covered in media who says, yes, we built this multi-million dollar portfolio totally DIY, I don't think that's representative of the whole community. Yeah. I think there are folks who say, I can do this, and financially I can make it work, but this just seems really scary to me. And I think those are, those are great folks to talk to, and it's, it's trusting that their assets are going to build up quickly, because I've talked to several advisors who say, well, that's not enough money for me to want to work with someone, and I think, but they're going to get to millions of dollars. It's just, yeah. it's going to take them a little time, but they're going to get there quickly. So if, for folks who are open to that, I think, I think there's a, a market. Yeah, yesterday Christine was talking at w um, one of the breakouts about hourly only financial advisors, so they, they are out there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a way to, uh, you can agree on how much you're gonna spend up front, you know, exactly how much, and there's no ongoing fees. So. Well, I mean, and, and a way that you could think of it too, th this is something I've, I've started thinking of, is for advisors to view, and to have like a, a side practice of hourly, um, and to do the fee only side there, that is almost like your individual corporate social responsibility or your CSR where you're trying to maybe be more inclusive or give advice to people whose assets wouldn't qualify them normally to work with you to manage their portfolio, but there's still an opportunity there to do some good and help people be better prepared for, I mean, the, the retirement crisis is no small thing. It's affecting a huge number of people. And so that, that could be your one way that you do some public service. What advice would you give to the uninitiated investor who's excited about the idea of values investing but is not yet knowledgeable about the fundamentals? I think the, the biggest advice I would give is, is the same advice I would give to any uninitiated investor, which is you don't need to actually know that much. And that there, there's sort of this, I think of it as a continuum. You've got the uninitiated investors who don't know much and are really aware that they don't know much. And then you've got this big middle and include a lot of the crypto bros in this who know a tiny bit but think they know a lot. Um, and then you've got the high end of the folks who actually do know a lot. Um, although even then, even when you know a ton, we all still bring our own ideology and our own biases to what you know. You know, and so I'd almost, I put it in quotes of, of what you know. But I think it's actually okay to be on the low information side and, and understand that there's a lot you don't need to know. So I think the biggest things to know are one, you don't need a complicated portfolio. You can have a complicated portfolio, and lots of people like that, but like know thyself. If, if you know that that will feel overwhelming, having something very simple going with a couple of well-diversified index funds, and there, there are increasingly some options for index funds that, that do some sort of impact aspect uh, one way or another, that, that's a perfectly good way to go. And then you have you know, your bond balance. Um, and that's great. And that, that could be all you ever do. And you just keep sinking money into that and let time pass. Um, but it's, it's also knowing that there are folks out there who want your money and are not necessarily doing as much good as they say. But there are also folks out there who are helping you figure that out. And I know um, that Morningstar has the Investable World platform that, that will help with that a lot, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is great. I think those are great tools for folks to be able to see through a lot of the marketing that's out there. Um, but I think, you know, read, read a book or two, audio book if you're not a good visual reader. Um, there are some, some great ones out there that really help simplify investing. And I think basically all of that stuff applies to responsible investing too. It just means you're going to be applying a different lens to the types of things you're choosing. Um, but again, good, good tools are coming out every day that are helping see through a lot of that. Let's take that last one. Uh, you mentioned gentrification. What are ways real estate investors can promote growth without displacement in cities? 
that's a great question. So real estate is a whole big topic, and I will try not to drag us too far down that rabbit hole. Uh, but you know, there, one of my big frustrations is how much a lot of real estate investing has been popularized, but in a way that totally makes it into jargon and completely separates it from what's happening, which is a person buys a property, a person or an, or an organization buys a property, and then that becomes someone's home. And a lot of the focus is on, well, how can you increase your cap rate so that you get the highest possible ratio of rent to purchase price? And it has folks saying, well, well let's all buy in Memphis, um, which is a really cheap place to buy, but we can get good rents. And, and don't talk about the fact that Memphis is one of the blackest cities in the country and one of the historically most marginalized in so many ways. You know, that the schools there are are really, in many cases, very bad for black folks who live there. And the economic opportunities are small. and things like that where you go, okay, is this really the community that you want to be getting rich off of? Um, I think that's part of the conversation that doesn't happen. Or then we see a lot of folks going to REITs, uh, the Real Estate Investment Trust. And then separately, I'll, I'll see people who I know were heavily invested in REITs then reposting articles that talk about how rents are skyrocketing and we're having this affordability crisis and that's so terrible. And I think do you not know the, that one is causing the other? It's the REITs that are funding the corporate folks who are going in and buying up all the housing and then jacking the rents way up. And so that, these are conversations that need to happen. And so I think thinking about it in that lens, it becomes easier then to say, okay, what am I ultimately trying to do? Am I trying to just retire early as quickly as possible and accumulate a portfolio of a lot of rental properties? Or am I actually trying to be a good citizen and provide a good home for someone and not exploit them? And so then looking at, you know, wherever you're looking, if it's looking at single family homes, okay, am I going to charge rent that is in line with the new investors in the neighborhood? Or am I going to charge rent that's in line with something more affordable to the income levels of the folks there? Am I going to evict at the first chance? Or am I going to give people some wiggle room because we're all human and times are tough? Um, things like that, I think, are, are just good questions to ask yourself. And if you have the stomach to go with a little bit more generosity, I think you're much less likely to be one of the bad guys. That's a good lead into this next question. Um, how can advisors help nudge clients from the obsession of acquiring and toward using their wealth to fund experiences and charitable giving? Uh, honestly, I wish I knew because I think <laughs> that's hard. I've seen a lot of folks and there's an offshoot of the fire movement called the fat fire movement where folks try to accumulate five to ten million dollars a person so that they can live large but I see a lot of folks living on fifty thousand dollars a year while planning to spend 250 a year and I've I've not yet seen anyone who lived that way who lived a really restricted life to save um, then turn around and suddenly spend all this money you know because you get in that habit or it's a very much like a scarcity mindset thing um, but I think there's a great book called scarcity uh, that is is helpful for some of that I think you can recommend that to clients if if that's something that you think they need but, but I think it's also being realistic. I mean, I think the charitable thing, I'm sure someone's come up with a clever way of saying, okay, well, we were targeting that we were going to grow 5% this year, but we actually grew nine. What do you say we put that overage into your donor advised fund or something like that? I, I have to believe there are creative solutions out there, but I think it's important to recognize that you're just really fighting psychology and ingrained mindset. And someone who's a good saver is going to naturally struggle to start spending. Mm -hmm. One more from the audience. Uh, great point on clients not always looking for the highest returns. Advisors need a way to show impacts of choices and progress toward goals. How can we do that? I think one of the great things, some of the, the funds that I mentioned earlier and some of those folks are doing great work around transparency and are making reporting a lot more robust. And so I think of it as creating multiple multiple things you know if you're if you're doing a dashboard for clients or you're doing you know some kind of portfolio visualization to show okay here are your returns here putting the impact metrics in there and that's going to look different depending on what they're interested in but if it's looking at how many solar panels did we build with our fixed income infrastructure bonds um, how you know every, every fund has their own sort of metrics but a lot of that is becoming more available, and I think it's great if advisors can show that, you know, bring those things into your reporting that you're giving to clients, so that I think that that makes them excited about what they're doing, and also 
I, I used to do, part of my job was marketing and thinking about how you can build brand loyalty with people. I think if you show people that you get them, that you get their concerns, you get their values, and you're also showing them results in more than one dimension, so yeah. it's not just bottom line, that's the kind of stuff that makes people want to stay with you for a long time and recommend all their friends because they feel like, okay, this is someone who really gets the whole picture and that's you know who they want to stick around with. Well, we have only one minute left. Um, is there anything that uh, we want to talk about that we didn't already touch no, on? That's great. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Thank you, Tanya, Thanks for being so much here. for being here. I really yeah. appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. This was a blast.